It was devastating. It was like front page news. Five people. I heard that in the local people. All in the headlines in the mid-1980s. It was all over the news. All tied to four notorious Colorado murders. We'd heard this. Cold for more than 30 years. And it was, pr it was pretty widely publicized. Early on a Friday morning in January 1984 in Kingman, Arizona, Roy Williams woke suddenly to a 25-pound rock smashing into him, <laughs> breaking a rib, tearing open his head. And at first I thought somebody just punched me right in the chin or something. Then the shadowy figure vanished into the desert. Seven hours later, a cop stopped a hitchhiker and started asking questions. The man bolted and was later captured in a nearby canyon. It was Alex Christopher Ewing. His arrest was front page news. He faced a trial, maybe some years in prison, and that might have been the end of the story. I was actually working graveyard. Eight months later, Uta Chambers was a rookie police officer in Henderson, Nevada, just outside Las Vegas. We were told that earlier that day there had been an escape. It was Ewing. He was riding in a sheriff's van on his way to court when deputies stopped for a bathroom break. We had gotten a call that there was somebody up in the neighborhood. We just saw a man running out there in our yard. So we went over there, we couldn't find anything. Yeah, just getting ready, getting ready to turn off the light. Heard the baby, got up. So I don't think he saw me at first. He was looking down the stairs and I was staring, looking at him for a minute before he turned around and saw me. I saw the club in his hand and I just freaked out. She ran to her bedroom where her husband sat up amid the chaos. And then all of a sudden, he's being, you know, pounded in the head. And the next thing I remember is I've got the phone in my hand and I'm dialing zero. And I just had a call with a woman screaming in the background, just bad, and it sounded like someone was beating her. We make eye contact, and then he comes around, and I put the phone down, and then I just dive down on the bed like that. I'm telling myself, just be quiet, play dead, you know. That's the only way he's going to stop. Nancy suffered a head wound. Oh, it was like this. Her hands broken, protecting her head. Her husband almost died. We had searched the house, and we had found the, the little baby in the crib in the next room. And uh, thank God nothing had happened to the, the little baby. They also found the couple's other son safe. And they found a broken axe handle. What they didn't find was Alex Ewing. We were sitting up at the ranger station. Everybody was looking for the escapee on the run. We got a call from dispatch. Ewing had made a collect call from a marina. Okay, so we came down. And as, as we arrived, there is Ewing. 35 years later. Somewhere in here, he made it over over the top of this little saddle here. Ranger Mike and Meyer vividly I recalls. I had re redrawn my weapon at this point. The moment he captured Ewing. Probably 75 feet away, there he is. Ewing went on trial in early 1985. There wasn't a dry eye in the, in the courtroom. Prosecutor Marty Keach remembers everyone moved by Nancy Berry's testimony. There wasn't a single person in that courtroom who wasn't scared of the guy sitting at the table next to me. It was clear this guy was a killer, and he had no qualms about killing. Convicted of attempted murder, burglary, and escape, Ewing was sentenced to 110 years. I mean, it was always there every day, always having, looking over my shoulder, you know, having my back up against the wall, you know, being uncomfortable. She wrote a letter when Ewing was eligible for parole a few years ago, but she'd largely left the attack in the past until August of 2018. A break in a murder case, cold for more than three decades. That's when a DNA test linked Alex Christopher Ewing to the unsolved Colorado murders of Patricia Smith and three members of the Bennett family in 1984, just days before the attack in Arizona. What these people must have gone through not even knowing where he was, I can't imagine how difficult that was for them. And difficult for five people to comprehend. What kind of person could do such a thing? When people are doing things that crazy, they're capable of doing anything. I don't know, if I think the guy's messed up. <laughs> I think he's the first person that I personally believe just to be kind of evil. Looking back on 30 years of law enforcement, I've never seen anybody have, have a flatter emotion. This guy was different, this, to me, okay? This guy was a sociopath. He, he, was a serial, he was a serial killer. I kind of feel grateful in a lot of ways. I mean, we're alive. You know, I mean, it could have been us, you know? We, we survived. 
Kyle and Kim, here's something to think about. Mm -hmm. When Ewing was arrested in Kingman 11 days after the Bennett murders, he told the police he had just hitchhiked into town from Colorado. Mm. The opportunity there for them to reach out if they'd want to back up here. Yeah. That's right. It was a near miss in this case. This case has had a number of those. We detail them all in our true crime podcast, Blame. It takes people back to 1984 and the way these crimes affected this community. It's available, the first five episodes, anywhere that people get their podcasts. Yeah. The connections made decades later. Yes. All right. Thank you, Kevin.